From 1939 to 1941, the German plan to invade Britain, Operation Sea Lion. Hitler's plan for invading Britain appeared at first glance to be as elaborately worked out as it was massively ambitious. Considered more closely, though, it starts to seem more sketchy. By the summer of 1940, there were only two countries left to fall to the Germans, Switzerland and Britain. There was real doubt in German minds about Switzerland. Did it offer more as a conquest or as a not altogether uncooperative, neutral neighbour? Britain, though, was both the more prestigious prize and potentially the most real and present danger. Along with an industrial base out of all proportion to its size and the resources of a world empire, in supplies and manpower, it had a formidable tradition of waging war by land and sea. An irrelevant army? That said, Hitler's Wehrmacht had by now made clear its mastery of the land. Having taken much of Western Europe in a matter of weeks, it had trounced the British Expeditionary Force, the BEF, in France so comprehensively that there was widespread disbelief that it had survived. Operation Sicklecut had so swiftly cut the British off that 2nd Corps Commander, General Alan Brooke, wrote, Nothing but a miracle can save the BEF now. A miracle of sorts occurred. More than a quarter of a million soldiers, French as well as British, were extricated between the 26th of May and the 4th of June. In failing to eliminate these fighting men, the Germans had made a serious mistake. In the long run, this was an omission that would come back to haunt them. For the moment, though, Britain's land forces were to all intents and purposes an irrelevance. Hitler found it easy to overlook them. Hitler had good reason to write off Britain's land forces after Dunkirk. Less excusable was his failure to take account for the episode's morale-raising power. Britain speak of the Dunkirk spirit to this day. The BEF's evacuation had been led by the Royal Navy, but hundreds of little ships had given their assistance too. Ferries and fishing boats, freighters, tugs, and even sailing yachts and cabin cruisers had all helped carry the soldiers to safety, crewed entirely by their civilian volunteers. The excitement of the experience had produced a national adrenaline rush. Britons were exhilarated by its skin-of-the-teeth success. An Amphibious Attack Hitler's plans for Operation Sea Lion, as recorded in his Directive No. 16, were issued on the 16th of July, said the Führer, Since Britain shows no sign of being prepared to come to an agreement despite her desperate military situation, I have resolved to prepare and, should it be necessary, pursue an amphibious operation against England. The point of this operation will be to prevent the English homeland from being used as a base for the continuation of the war against Germany. If need be, the whole island might be occupied. An amphibious force was to move in along a broad front, he said, stretching from the area of Ramsgate to that of the Isle of Wight. This far from the continent, the Luftwaffe would have to do duty as artillery, the navy as engineers. The different branches of the German military should think things through from their own perspectives, said Hitler. If any advance operations, such as the occupation of the Isle of Wight or the County of Cornwall, were going to be needed to make the landing possible, then this was the time to plan them. Though, the final decision to proceed would rest with him. The Aryan Angle Since Britain shows no sign of being prepared to come to an agreement, is there a hint of wistfulness in the Führer's tone? Had Hitler been hoping that the Anglo-Saxons would rethink their positions? There certainly seems to have been a hint of that in the last appeal to reason he made in the Reichstag on the 19th of July, 1940. Copies of this were showered over southeastern England from German planes. The Nazis, he insisted, had only ever wanted to free their country from the unfair penalties laid upon it by the Versailles Treaty. 
and from the fetters of a small substratum of Jewish capitalist and Pluto-democratic profiteers. Right-thinking Englishmen and women would surely see the justice in this fight. Hitler was, if not an Anglophile, then an admirer of the British imperial achievement. As the English historian Andrew Roberts reminds us in his 2009 study, The Storm of War, even while the fight for France was raging, he points out the German leader was talking in flattering terms of the civilization that Britain had brought to the world. What Roberts describes as the slapdash nature of the Nazi invasion plan can be easily explained, he argues, Hitler's heart simply wasn't in it. And ultimately, that was why the sea lion didn't swim. Preparations were to be completed by the middle of August, some four weeks off. In that time, the Führer noted, key conditions had to be met. A. The English Air Force must be so far neutralised, both physically and in morale, that it will be able to put up no significant resistance to the German invasion. B. Sea lanes must be cleared of mines. C. Both entrances to the Straits of Dover and the western approach to the Channel in a line roughly from Alderney to Portland are to be closed off by minefields. D. Landing zones must be covered by heavy artillery on the continental coast. E. British naval forces should be kept occupied both in the North Sea and by the Italians in the Mediterranean for the period before the invasion. All these conditions came down to the same thing, really. The English Channel had to be a German pond for troops in vast numbers to make their way across safely. Its shores, too, had to be under German control. Disembarkation Dilemmas This was all the more important, because the Germans had as yet no purpose-built landing craft to call upon. Hitler was hoping to do the whole thing using canal and river barges. Of the 2,000-odd craft his Kriegsmarine managed to commandeer in Germany and the conquered Benelu countries, only about a third were engine-powered, and their engines were designed for use in sheltered inland waterways. The remainder would have to be towed across the channel by tugs and other powered vessels. When they reached their destination, moreover, they would have to be painstakingly and precisely moved into position so that the troops on board could be discharged in safety. The tanks, trucks, heavy equipment, and material of every kind unloaded without loss. These are not the kind of manoeuvres that can be conducted under heavy fire, or, for that matter, in heavy seas. It wasn't that Operation Sea Lion was impractical as such, it might have worked. In the right conditions, had the conditions had been just so. The difficulties facing Sea Lion had been identified at the end of 1939, when army chiefs drew up their own plans for an amphibious invasion of England in the study document Nordwest. They had identified a starting point in Belgium, and a landing site much further north along the East Anglican coast. But this received a scornful rejection from Reichmarkel. Hermann Goering. So pessimistic was he about the prospects for any such amphibious invasion that he had said it could only be the final conclusion of an already victorious war in Britain. Any resistance would be too much resistance, he felt, for what was bound to be a slow and cumbersome and substantially defenceless seaborne force. Firepower. In some respects, it should be acknowledged, circumstances actually favoured the Germans. Now that they had occupied the Pas de Calais coast of northern France, it was easy enough to bring up big guns that could pound British shipping in the Channel, and even to some extent, the southern English coast. The largest of several railway guns, the K-12, had a 21cm, 8.3-inch barrel, and a range of 115 kilometers, or 71 miles. Four permanent batteries, fortified with concrete, were placed in positions that commanded the channel waters. Several mobile batteries were also brought into play. German gunners could pick off British vessels more or less at will. 
Further mobile batteries were made ready for installation on the English side just as soon as a successful landing had taken place. The broad front was quickly narrowed, landing men in meaningful numbers along more than 190 kilometers or 120 miles of coast would have required a force of over 160,000. It was decided that the landing area would extend from Rottingdean, just east of Brighton, to Hythe in southern Kent. Even this would require a force of 67,000 troops. The Kriegsmarine would provide an escort, but the emphasis would be on creating diversions in the days before the attack took place. For all the ferocity of its U-boat war, Germany's surface navy was small and weak, particularly by comparison with that of an island nation which, however beleaguered now, had been able to boast that it ruled the waves since the 18th century. There was nothing to be gained from taking on the Royal Navy in a straight fight, so it was hoped that diversionary sorties of the type that the cruiser Admiral Hipper was to undertake in the North Atlantic, between Iceland and the Faroes, would have the effect of drawing away British naval vessels. Foiled by Fighters the Führer can be congratulated on having spotted the central weakness of his own scheme. The need to neutralise the RAF had been his point A, of course. In the event, the few of the RAF's fighter force famously took to the air that July in response to wave after relentless wave of German attacks. Several dramatic weeks later, they had driven the Luftwaffe from England's skies. The rest is history and Operation Sea Lion isn't. In late September, it was quietly dropped. <laughs>